Hello, and thank you so much for having me today here to give the presentation about the master rubric for bioinformatics. My name is Jessica Lindvall, and I am from LXE Sweden. And uh, in Sweden, the, uh, the Swedish node consists of a research infrastructure called National Bioinformatics Infrastructure Sweden, or NBIS for short. And today's talk have the title of Introducing the Master Rubric for Bioinformatics, Applications to Training and Professional Development. However, this is not a one-man job, not at all. Um, it has been a team's work over several years. Some of the team members are most probably in the audience here today, listening to this and can answer questions um, when they come in into the chat and also afterwards. And these are the people I really want to acknowledge Rochelle Trachtenberg, Allegra Via, and Terry Atwood. And since this is a recording, um, I uh, ask you to place the questions in the chat and uh, team members will answer them or save them to um, after the presentation where I hope that this presentation will spark some thoughts, ideas, and, and discussions. So here we go. The overview of this uh, presentation is that I'm thinking that I should give you an overview of what the master rubric for bioinformatics is. I will continue with a visual tour, which basically will be the same as in the first section of the talk, however, in a bit different, slight different way, which we hope that will help you digest the master rubric for bioinformatics further and maybe put it in other perspectives. And in the end, I will show you two ways how to use the master rubric for bioinformatics and how this tool can really be a support and help to you when you either set up a course or in your own professional development. So what is the master rubric for bioinformatics? You can find all the details of the tools in the paper that we published in late uh, 2019 in PLOS One. And the paper is called The Master Rubric for Bioinformatics, a tool to support design and evaluation of career spanning education and training. And you find the DOI at the bottom of this page, but please, you don't need to write anything. The presentation will be available to you later on and uh, also the reference will be um, gathered uh, in, a, in a slide at the end. So for those of you that have read this paper, you have already discovered table one and table one in the paper is the master rule for bioinformatics. And essentially it is a descriptive table with three dimensions where you have the y-axis that lists the knowledge, skills, abilities, the so-called KSAs, and these are the intended KSAs that should be delivered by a course or a program. And then you have the, uh, the x-axis, sorry, that outlines a developmental trajectory from less to more expert. Here it is from novice to independent journeyman. And then you have an in the individual cells, like the one highlighted here, that describes in detail how a learner might be expected to perform and then how it changes over time when then progressing along that trajectory, so along the x-axis. And these are the so-called performance levels descriptors that you see in the cells, the so-called PLDs. And as you can see at just this first glance, there's quite a lot to take in. So to help navigate a bit through this uh, table or to better orientate ourselves, I can say, we can highlight its main features. And this is exactly the same thing, the same slide, but just colored in. And here then at the top, you have the general description, and it's a general description of an individual at a given stage. 
And I should say that you are not meant to read this. It's uh, just for you to note that there is a progression as an individual advances from novice to journeyman. And alongside this description are the requisite stages of Bloom's hierarchy of cognitive complexity. And this builds from lower to higher order critical thinking skills. So from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level six. And then beneath these are the 12 KSAs and their corresponding PLDs for each stage. And however, this is just the first page of, of the table and as you can see, it is massive. And it covers a total of six pages. And clearly, uh, and clearly I mean this really also for myself, this isn't the easiest thing to digest. So let's see if we can summarize the whole thing in a much simpler table. And this can look like this. So again, note the 12 KSAs on the Y axis, one on each row. And I should point out that these KSAs are not co to be confused with the KSAs encapsulated in, in various competency frameworks that are out there. So these KSAs that are referred to here in the mastery rubric are much broader and or, or higher level concepts, one can say. And then as before, the stages are along the x-axis and denoting in each column a particular point in the developmental trajectory from less to more expert. And then the descriptions of the learner performance, the performance levels descriptor at those levels that are given in each cells. So the key take home message here is that the KSAs the stages and the PLDs. This, this is the master rubric for bioinformatics. And it is a big ask to expect anyone to take all of this in, in one go. So let's try now to, to look at the master rubric for bioinformatics from a slightly different pr perspective. And this is what I meant in the beginning of the talk. So hopefully, this will help you to mentally unpack its components uh, and also to better show how all fits together and, and how it can be used. Um, and it's important to stress that the key thing here is the concepts and not the details. So try to keep that in, in mind. And again, if you have any question, paste them in the chat and uh, someone um, from the team will answer them hopefully. So the first thing to note is that the master rubric builds on the European Guild structure and the European Guild structure outlines a trajectory from apprentice through journeyman to what was originally called master craftsman or tradesman. And this European Guild structure is ancient. So this has been around for centuries. However, the master rubric adds two further stages that is novice, and beginner. And the master rubric also differentiates uh, um, the journeyman stage into an early and a late stage, so J1 and J2. And this is to recognize that the journeyman period is generally the longest phase of training. So what I mean is that it's, for instance, it's observable differences between a newly qualified individual, say a new PhD, and then one, say, with 10, 10 or more years of experience. And that could be an independent research fellow or a PI. And these two, and the later one, um, has arguably achieved master in, in his or her subject. Each of these stages can be mapped to the relevant Bloom level from remember understand which is the lower level b1 b2 through apply analysis analyze b3 b4 to synthesize and evaluate which is b5 and b6 and then similarly each stage can be mapped to stages in what we see as traditional academic trajectory from undergraduate through masters to phd to postdoc fellows and ultimately to an independent PI. 
And as shown earlier, the master rubric lists the KSAs a program is intended to deliver. And for bioinformatics, there are these are based on foundational discipline specific KSAs. And here we have prerequisite of biology and prerequisite of computational methods. Then we have nine further KSAs that are based on scientific method. These are more um, domain unspecific KSAs. So independent of your uh, domain of expertise, these are KSAs that should be following your trajectory. And then last but not we have the uh, ethical practice. And hopefully this is the beginning to give you a better feel on how each of the stages builds layer upon layer onto the next in terms of cognitive complexity. So advancing in blooms. And this is as an individual progresses from less to more expert. So from novice, which is the outside layer to independent scientist, which is the inside layer. So let's take a closer look at this layer by layer. Hidden within each of the layers are the performance level descriptors, the PLDs, that describe what it should look like as learners develop from less to more expert and then demonstration for each of these KSAs. Again, you are not meant to read this. And as we saw before, alongside the PLDs are a general description of an individual at this stage. And then you have the requisite bloom level and the stage of academic training. So here, for example, the novice is somebody who reads and generally understands, but doesn't question research results, etc. And the blooms level would then be remember, understand one or two, and that reflect this uh, statement of description. And these could typically describe an early undergraduate thinking. And at this stage, beginner stage, uh, this beginner is beginning to learn how to apply software to a given problem, etc. And the blooms level have changed now accordingly, as you see, to understand apply, which is B2, B3. And this might be a typical description of an early master student. At the next level, the apprentice, this is someone that's becoming more expert at analysis, but may not be aware of other equally viable approaches, hence still need guidance. The Bloom's level have progressed from applying, analyzing and beginning to synthesize. So we are talking here about B3 to early B5 in the Bloom's um, hierarchy, and which might be a typical description of late masters and early PhD students. At the first journeyman level, the J1, this here we find a newly, the newly qualified independent scientist, but in fact, general still requires some supervision. This is typically of an early postdoc fellow, for instance. And the Bloom's level has moved on to include the ability of such individuals to evaluate, but with guidance still. At the second journeyman level, J2, here we find the confident expert in his or her field, most likely a PI with an independent research group. And this individual has the cognitive, cognitive abilities that are of the highest Bloom's level, and that is of evaluate and B6. And now then bringing all of these components together, these cognitive layers, this is the master rubric for bioinformatics, a standard framework for developing scientific and discipline specific KSAs from less to more expert. And one of the really useful things about, about it is that its structures readily allows it to be adapted to related discipline. And this is just simply by changing the discipline specific KSAs while keeping the scientific method related KSAs 
essentially being the same or intact. So it's a plug and play tool, if you like, for related scientific disciplines, as then for the bioinformatics field, the prerequisite of biology and the prerequisite of computational methods are the domain specific cases. So now when I have presented the tool, uh, how it looks like, and, and hopefully um, at least started to unravel the, the thing for you, how can we then use it? Because a tool is just as good as how you use it, right? Uh, it's not really worth a lot if you can't use it. Uh, that goes for every, any tool or program that we, we do. So how do we do this? We will first take a look uh, at a simple application to professional development. And this is intended as a brief run through, again, to illustrate the principles rather than the details. So keep that in mind. In this application, we imagine that a life science PI wants to become self-sufficient in basic bioinformatics techniques and not have to hassle his or her colleagues or students for help. And this individual recognizes him or herself as a J2 independent life scientist. And this is someone who makes predictions, evaluates relevant methods and can generalize to other biological systems and so on. And as you can see in the highlighted performance levels descriptor here, and, and note that the requisite Bloom's level reflecting that. So this is a person that is a J2 evaluates um, in the level of Bloom's in the biology uh, KSA. But this individual also recognizes him or herself as a beginner in computational methods who wants to understand how to code and apply bioinformatics tools in his or her work. Again, uh, note the change in Bloom's level here, please. And who consider him or herself as a J1 in identifying relevant data, but needs help to identify relevant bioinformatics data resources and to evaluate their relative strengths and weaknesses. Who recognizes him or herself as a beginner in identifying or using appropriate bioinformatic methods and interpreting results. Needing help to apply specific bioinformatic methods and to understand pipelines and to fully understand stated p-values in program outputs. Again, the Bloom's level reflect all of these things. Who recognizes him or herself as an apprentice in drawing conclusions and ethical practice. And needing help to contextualize and synthesize coherent bioinformatics conclusions and to apply bioinformatics relevant ethical practices and so on. And although here it's just cherry picked some indicative phrases from the relevant performance level descriptors for each stage of each KSA, and just for illustrative purposes, I still argue that the PLDs should not be taken entirely literally. The PLDs are intended as guides to the types of behavior learners may exhibit at a given stage of a given KSA, but other descriptions could be more relevant or suitable depending on the context and or type of course being offered. So that is quite important to, to reflect on here. Overall, in this way, the master rubric for bioinformatics can be a useful tool for self-guidance, helping individuals to pinpoint and focus on their specific training needs. And if shared with an instructor, these provide key insights about those training needs to the instructor. A key point here is that J2 in one discipline may, may be, and almost certainly is, a novice beginner apprentice in some other discipline. Every individual's background is different. And as an aside, this is important. Uh, has important ramifications for students in your classes, which may include complete novices new to an undergraduate program, 
and, mat and mature students who may already have a master's or PhD. They may be apprentice or J1 in another perhaps related discipline. And again, everyone is different as we know. Then coming to application two, very briefly will be course design. Again, it's the principles and not the details uh, that are important. In this application, we imagine being a university teacher who wants to develop an introductory module for basic bioinformatics master science course. The first step is to identify the KSAs relevant to the course and appropriate developmental stages. So let's say that we want the module to build from foundational, beginner level uh, biology, computational methods, and ethical practice. To apprentice level, applying appropriate methods, interpreting results, uh, drawing conclusions and communicating. So putting these layers together, the focus of this module is on building up from beginner level biology, computational methods and ethical practice to apprentice level identifying and using appropriate method, interpreting results, drawing conclusions and communicating. So we focus on these stages and these KSAs and we ignore the rest. To build a course around these, uh, indeed any course, of course, focusing on any KSAs, so we recommend following a structured paradigm by, by, uh, to build a course. And you can find more details of our recommendations in the guidelines for curriculum and course development. And this we made as a, uh, available as a preprint in the SOS uh, archives last year. And we also released a more practical hands-on version specifically for trainers. Uh, and you can find that in this F1000 bioinformatics education and training collection. And again, do not need to write all the DOIs and references. It will all be part of the presentation and shown at the later um, uh, slide. And, at, and, and the, in these documents here, you will see that we use something that, that is called Nichols five phase paradigm for curriculum and course design as an exemplar, which is illustrated here in the diagram on the left. And details of the model aren't important here. So the point is that there are five key phases in the course design process, from defining LOs to selecting LEs, so learning experiences, to selecting content, devising appropriate assessments to course and evaluation. And at each phase, there are a decision point to test where the specific criteria have been met. For instance, are the learning objectives smart? If the criteria has not been met, either the phase requires revision, the previous phase needs revision, or phase one needs revision. And only after this iterative cycle of revision and refinement at each step can the process be regarded as complete. Then coming to the gold star, and the crucial take home here is that phase one is the first class citizen of the design process because each phase must be congruent with it. And phase one is articulating the learning outcomes. So everything stems for articulating good learning outcomes, smart learning outcomes. So we start the course design process by articulating the intended learning outcomes. And these are statements that detail what students will be able to do and the teacher will be able to assess by the end of a course. 
So learning outcomes are phrased actively, articulate, articulating what students will be able to do. For instance, by the end of this course, student will be able to, and then for this course and module, appropriate beginner level, understand, um, uh, apply. And uh, learning outcomes for biology might then be, uh, by the end of this course, students will be able to explain the central dogma uh, or describe the challenges of gene prediction in terms of gene structure and for computational methods approach at beginning levels LOs might be by the end of this course students will be able to list popular databases and protein sequence and structure analysis tools or search databases using BLAST uh, or other bespoke software tools. Appropriate apprentice level, apply, analyze and synthesis uh, LOs for identify and use appropriate methods might be that by the end of the course, students will be able to apply fingerprints uh, and uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, apply uh, fingerprint and HMM tools to identify the family to which protein sequences belong, or for interpretation and of results. By the end of the course, students will be able to analyze search outputs to determine the biological significance of results. <clears throat> and for draw conclusions, uh, by the end of the course, students will be able to synthesize uh, results from different analyses to draw preliminary conclusion about the likely function of protein sequences. And then for communication, by the end of the course, the students will be able to present results to a lay audience. And note that these are all active behaviors at the requisite loops level that the teacher will, in principle, be able to assess. And the examples are clearly just fabricated, but hopefully will show how learning outcomes can be informed by the relevant KSA and PLDs at each stage. Again, the performance level descriptors are not meant to be taken literally, but rather to be used as guides towards what might be appropriate behaviors and outcomes at, at a given development, developmental stage. And that is really it regarding the tool. And personally, I find this tool used in this way really helpful both with regards to my own professional development but also with regards to designing courses um, and modules or, or sessions uh, of any kind uh, actually just by looking at the master rubric for bioinformatics as a tool in this more visualized way helped me to choose the right uh, to state the more correct and actively learning outcomes that are smart. So I hope that you also will find this tool quite useful in, this, in, the, in both of these senses and maybe also find other use cases or ways to use these tools. So just as a conc to conclude, the master rubric provides a standard framework for developing scientific and discipline specific KSAs from less to more expert. The master rubric for bioinformatics structures, the structure allows it to be adapted to related disciplines simply by changing its discipline specific KSAs. So the master rubric structure um, in itself allow you to build another master rubric for another um, uh, related discipline and it's a multi-layer tool with applications in professional development and course design and with that I just like to say that it's not as scary as it looks so why not just try it see how it feels and let us know how it works for you and with that, thank you so much for your attention. Here are the references that has been um, uh, written throughout the presentation. 
Again, here is the team with all the contact information if you at any point want to give it, get in contact with us. And I'm sure that some team members are in the audience, even if I'm not there, that can answer questions um, that have been rising up during the presentation or any discussion would be so nice to have. So please reach out. Um, and we can have a Zoom fika, uh, a Zoom coffee uh, at any time and discuss more. And thank you so much and have a really lovely uh, conference and meeting. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so Jessica did an excellent job explaining the mastery rubrics. It certainly is not as scary as one might think first. So, uh, let me see, both Allegra and Terry are here. So if there are any questions, I'm sure that they can answer. So Celia has a question. Yes, I, I have a question uh, <clears throat> to, to Terry and Allegra because I am really interested in this and I'm now also wondering because the method has now been around for a few years and do you already have first of all I would like to know how you use it yourself and also if you have already insight in how the community is taking it up and maybe as a follow-up question if if goblet could mean something here like a test bed or any your thoughts about that just was my my first thoughts that came to my mind <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, I can say um, I don't actually use it because I'm retired. Um, so I'm not actively teaching anymore. Um, I wish something like this had been around when I was developing master's programs. Um, so yes, it would have been useful to me back then. Um, from a goblet perspective, you will hear tomorrow. Um, that I've already uh, created a, a guide, um, one of the professional guides outlining the, the structure that, that Jessica has just described for you. And I will then go on to create another one about how to use it in more detail. Um, so this is going very much, I see it as a collaborative work with Goblet. Um, and as Jessica said, you know, encourage people to to have a play with it and feed back to us because um, go Goblet would be a fantastic testing bed for it. Mm, I can add about the usage um, that we um, we kind of try to use it and, and still keep trying uh, uh, to use it uh, in, in the context of the, the curriculum development, the learning path development for uh, data manager steward, uh, data management steward, stewardship and, and analysis. Um, so, but still the, the thing is that we started without using it. And then at some point, I think, thanks to, to uh, uh, Terry's seminar about uh, how to use, uh, uh, how uh, not only what uh, uh, it was and, and how to use, I mean, the seminar that was, uh, I mean, very similar to this one given by, by Jessica. Uh, so at some point we introduced the master rubric, and but uh, uh, when the, our work was uh, uh, pretty advanced. So the thing is that now we are sort of using it, but not really how it should be used. Um, and also in my teaching, uh, uh, honestly, I use it quite a lot in um, uh, PhD student supervising. It is very useful for this. And um, and I use some elements in um, lesson and, and course uh, development, um, but only some elements. Uh, honestly, the thing is that the the tool is quite complex. And okay, Terry, tomorrow will tell you more about uh, what what's uh, what is going what is being the effort in order to make it the usability of the master rubric uh, for bioinformatics. Uh, uh, easier and more approachable. Thanks. I'm looking forward to the talk tomorrow. <laughs> okay. 
uh, are there other questions to Terry and Allegra? I don't see any hands, so then uh, we can continue. We are a bit ahead of time. Um, but our next speaker is Eric uh, Bonkang Rudloff, who has been active in EMB Net for ages and ages. And he's also the former president of EMB Net, um, the professor at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And Eric has a very Eric like title. So, do Android's dream of electric sheep? An EMP net view on bioinformatics education. So please, Eric, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give a talk. I don't know if you can see my my whole screen. You need to put it on the as a view speaker in the main uh, area. Uh, as I only can see the clock at the moment. Can everyone see me? Uh, we can see you, certainly. We cannot and see your slides. It, uh, it's only that I don't see the window in the middle, but maybe everyone can see that. Can you confirm? Then I start. So you uh, need so, to put... So, Lubas, do you know technically what we need to do, what Eric wants us to do? In the right, top right corner, you have to switch view to speaker view. That's probably Eric means. Everyone needs to do that. View speaker. Ah, okay. All right. Right. So, the top uh, right hand corner, there is this view thingy. And there, if you, it's in a gallery mode usually. So if you click speaker, then yeah. you should be able to see. Yep, thanks. Yeah, so you see my screen in full. Can you do that now? Yeah. Then I will start. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> oh, Eric, we cannot see your screen, your display. Uh, you should see me uh, on the. If you choose on the right hand and top where it says view and you select speaker. Yes, I have it, but uh, is anyone seeing Eric's desktop? Have you actually oh. shared your screen, Eric? No, I don't think so. No, because I'm not sharing my screen. I'm sharing my view. You, you have to share see your me. Screen. No. As I then, see then, you. then that's fine. Okay, yes. Yeah, but now you see, see you. me. We see it's, you very big and your slides very small because yes, they only make that's the five. idea. Yeah, that's the idea. They, they love to see you, of course, but they would also <laughs> like to see the slides, you see. Is me, is uh, egocentric? No, is, is part of it. So I would start now. I'm sure that everyone is seeing this. Then, so, then that's fine. Uh, I hope your letters are not too small then. <laughs> no. Uh, Go ahead. So the actual uh, presentation is uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Uh, it's just a view that I had a, a, a crazy idea uh, about this. And now you should see it fully. Uh, so uh, I was presented, I don't need more presentation. And the whole uh, idea is that as uh, Eja pointed out, I've been around for ages. Uh, I was once young, uh, and it's part of the of the <laughs> of the whole story today. Um, so EMVNet was created 1988 and started producing teaching materials since then. There are materials all over in many servers that came out and disappeared, and others that are coming today. And all the time, as things have been changing. So when I started uh, as a teacher in bioinformatics, and this was in the uh, EMB Net Sweden uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, when I went to different places to teach, uh, most people uh, did not said, did not say uh, I'm going to a course in bioinformatics. They just said I'm going to a course in GCG because GCG, the Wisconsin package was synonymous with bioinformatics. So that was the, the way, this was a very expensive package. Most universities did not have, could, could not afford this. 
Um, nevertheless, it was the, the most well-established package. For that reason, the EMBnet, together with the other uh, actors, they um, created what it was called, and is called the EMBOSS package, that it contains most of the tools that were in this previous uh, commercial package, but made them uh, open source and free distributable. And this started in some way the philosophy that today most uh, bioinformatics packages and education are uh, centered it around. So this is, is politics and should never be forgotten. Uh, things are related to how we, willing we are to share our knowledge and to share our resources with each other. When we do that, we can do marvelous things. Um, the EMBOSS package was one of the tools we were teaching, but we also had a lot of teaching in SRS package. This was a, a system that allowed for beautiful uh, advance, I would say, work. Uh, work that today many people are not uh, aware of that they can do. And uh, it, it was possible to search for, let's say, all the new sequences that are related to a certain disease in a certain uh, organism that also have uh, uh, not only the gene, but the protein, and maybe you could even select the, only the ones that do have a three-dimensional structure in the PDB database. So this was very nice, but today uh, most people and the young people have no idea about the existence of this, and they are reinventing the wheel. I can see in many uh, uh, articles that are sent to journals that some people created similar things. Nevertheless, we have today Biomark that can do partly of this, not even close to what SRS was doing, but it was nice. And this, this was the kind of, I would say, teaching that we did in the 90s and in the beginning of the 2000. Uh, in 2000, uh, we got the, the, the first big genomes. Uh, those were expensive things, uh, it cost a fortune to, to, to do one. Um, and uh, even if you did a bacteria genome, that will end in the front uh, of uh, nature or science. Uh, and for that reason, we organized a lot of teaching. And some of the teachings were organized by projects that were financed by EMBnet, but many other organizations and initiatives. I'm just talking about the things I was involved in because then I can relate to that. And I have pictures, <laughs> otherwise I cannot show them. So this was a regulatory sequence discovery workshop organized in Uppsala by the EMBnet. And why I'm showing this is because to tell that for the young people today, that even the teachers were young ones. And uh, to this workshop attended certain people that are present today. So you can see here when uh, this is 2004, it's on almost 20 years ago. Uh, and we can see some of the participants of this meeting when there were also uh, students there participating, even though they were expert and very knowledgeable people, but you could have the old pictures. And here you have some more of them. I have even more, but we have no time to go through these things. Um, this is interesting. Uh, I have pictures where you see uh, la creme de la creme in bioinformatics in in europe just in in one little room because most people there were no more than that and the amounts of people being uh involved in teaching were not that many um what happened then in the middle of of the year 2000 is that we got the next generation sequencing that nowadays young students don't say next generation sequencing because the generations are several so it's high throughput sequencing and this change the way that we work in the way that most people in life science work and that also change all the contents and all the type of uh, of teaching that we we were doing and not only because we wanted, but because it was needed as people had no limits of what they wanted to do. And nowadays you need to have many thousands of genomes to get the front page of, of nature or science. That means that you need really to do a, a huge work, even though the work is advanced and is a lot of work, 
uh, it doesn't count very much because everyone can do this. So uh, as an example, the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, the aim is to sequence uh, several million genomes in all over. And this is very important in a way because we are destroying the planet in, in much faster uh, speed than we are reading genomes. Uh, all these curves that we show about how cheap and fast things are going in our area, they should always be construct, con, uh, constructed with the destruction we are doing. Uh, more species disappear in the planet every month that we would like to this to happen. Um, these new NGS uh, uh, technologies and all these wonderful things, they made uh, most of us to be engaged in many courses. That picture that I was showing, just show one of them that when we, together with the ISCB, we organized uh, a course in Barcelona when the NGS uh, initiative, many of you have been involved. It was a uh, NGS cost action that uh, initiated many, many courses and training and created a lot of uh, resources also that later on were shared. The only problem is that everything you create in NGS after two, three years is absolutely obsolete because all the software is upgraded. So this is a a, a big uh, uh, race. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and of course, please don't criticize me for being so incredible egocentric, but I only found these pictures the, during the weekend. Um, uh, I would like to have pictures for many more, uh, and I will put them in my next coming presentations, but this is just showing that there was a, a big demand in in learning about all these new technologies all over the planet. So the pictures are showing you the Antarctic Research Institute, the Colombo University uh, Research Institute, uh, uh, several uh, workshops in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And they deal from plant biology, animal sciences to medical sciences. Um, what happened then? We were all super active and we were organizing all these courses and uh, many projects even got funding and then suddenly we could not, use, not even use the money anymore because we were not supposed to travel and we were not supposed to organize, uh, I would say, face-to-face -face, uh, courses. So when COVID came, uh, we all moved to Zoom as we are doing today. And this changed the way that we work in, in which way, well, we have to adapt and create online courses. What is interesting here, and I had to mention this, is that the EMBnet already in 2002 were, was organizing all the meetings of the network with a, a system, video, video system called Maratech. People uh, is, uh, is kind of cyclic. We do things, people forget that, and then we are back to the same, and then people don't even remember that some other people were doing this. Uh, this is interesting because not only we had our regular meetings using this, but we also organized uh, courses. So we had, a, as an example, uh, a course in Bogota in Colombia, well, the students were sitting in a classroom, but the teachers, some of the teachers were sitting in Switzerland and some in other countries. And this was not a big problem. And it, this is all is almost 20 years ago. So it's all the time the same. History repeats itself. And why I'm talking about history, you will see in a moment. So when COVID, uh, got into our nerves. Uh, as you all know, I'm really, I, I've been in, in Stockholm twice now, almost two years. Uh, I've not been outside Sweden for two years. And, and I seldom go out because in Sweden, there is no restrictions and people are running around like it was no pandemics. And I'm a little uh, uh, scared of, of getting it. Uh, so things are, are, are getting in that way. So Vaccines are helping. Everyone uh, put their um, trust in this. And there are several of them. They use different technologies. Most of these technologies are due only to the knowledge that we have in molecular biology and very much in bioinformatics. You all know that everyone nowadays talk about terminology that we only used before in bioinformatics or very advanced 
molecular biology, but the journalists are doing it, people in the homes are doing it. It's just incredible how fast this has, has gone. The only problem with these new um, vaccines is that the efficiency is not very high. So some of them are not that efficient even after six months or a year of uh, administrating this. So there, there is need for improvement. And that is what I wanted to mention today as an example. There is one uh, new vaccine that is coming called Novavax that is very promising in many ways, is efficient. It takes, uh, it will give, give a protection for longer time, but it's also much, much cheaper than all the others. So the developing world will benefit from this and their their goal is to produce billions of these uh of these vaccines this vaccine is not only for COVID, but it has also been uh being developed uh, a variant of it the same company to ebola and other uh, of these uh, zoonotic diseases which is something that will affect uh, humanity more and more now that we are almost nine thousand million people that are just putting away all living organisms in very small uh, reserves. Uh, what is interesting with this is that why this vaccine works and works differently is because the vaccine is using uh, synthetically produced spike proteins uh, to, to be administered, not just RNA that will produce or not produce high or low amounts when it's uh, transfected into the muscle cells by the injection, but this uh, contains an adjuvant, adjuvant that helps to boost the immune system to produce uh, antibodies related to uh, COVID. And these adjuvants that are the most interesting here is based on uh, saponin. And saponin, uh, there are many, many plants have this but many of them are toxic to humans. So you cannot use all the saponins, but it was found that a, a tree and the tree bark of a tree in Chile, a, a tree that has been used by thousands of years by the Mapuche Indians there to wash their hair and as a medical plant, uh, contained the, the best saponins that could, they could find. Uh, why is this so interesting for us and why I'm talking about this? Not only that this was found, but very much because it's ancestral knowledge. This, this knowledge is based on the knowledge that the Indians had and they were ignored for many years because uh, the, the society in Chile is very racist and they ignore everything that's coming from their, uh, I would say, indigenous populations. Um, what is interesting here is that this tree that used the bark to isolate the saponins, is you can isolate very, very small amounts of, uh, of, of this uh, ingredient from these trees. And the company is planning to produce billions of, of uh, dose, doses for, for people. So the production started is very promising, but what happened? Well, So the problem is that there are not so many trees left that uh, are indigenous and uh, uh, the, the ones that are endemic because the big companies in the world have been cutting down all these forests and planting eucalyptus and pines because it's more productive. And this is what we are doing all over the planet. This is Jana, as an example, I think it's an excellent example to show that we, in the bioinformatics community, we need to teach people, we need to train people to understand why this is so important, not only for academic, but for humanity and survival. And we need to learn from the old to teach the young, and we need to keep this in, in a way that uh, is understandable because it's the only way of surviving today. Uh, this, to me, is 
that without knowledge of the ecosystems and the diversity that the planet have, that will make us to lose the cure for many future diseases. Nature can provide us with many of the cures that we will need in the future when more and more zoonotic diseases will, uh, uh, I would say, treat uh, humanity. And we have to make this uh, a priority and we need to teach and we need to talk about this. Uh, I will end with this because this is what I wanted to present to you and why it was about this, um, uh, the, the electric uh, sheep is coming from a book. Uh, and that book ended in a movie called Blade Runner. Uh, and I think that a lot of bioinformaticians are like uh, science fiction. And the ending scene of this is that people do not listen to the people with experience and the knowledge is gone. Uh, and this is something that we teachers need to take care of. I watched sea beams glitter in the darkness for 10 hours a day. All those moments will be lost in time. Like <clears throat> tears. So, why I'm talking about these things? Uh, very much because I've been touched by uh, some of our uh, former node managers that have uh, passed away because of COVID and friends that have passed away. And also because <laughs> last week I got a letter that I'm close to my retirement and I should uh, uh, send a letter if I want to work for more two years or retire next year. So these things make you think a lot about what you have done and what uh, is the future and what is to be done. And I think that what we are doing with uh, Goblet and Ian Binet and all our friends uh, teaching and uh, sharing our knowledge that is the result of years of practice is so incredibly important. Uh, that was it. And uh, I hope that <laughs> it was not uh, a loss of time for you. Thank you. <laughs>